When I started this review, it was suggested that I don't go full on Neil deGrasse Tyson on it, so I'll try hard not to point out that while the moon is tightly locked, it's not exactly in a geosynchronous orbit. This game was played on Windows PC and a review key was kindly provided by Kyokin Interactive and Plan of Attack. It's 30 years in the future and humankind has effed up the planet's environment so badly that they decide to microwave it from space. This of course goes wrong, something fails and you're sent alone to the moon five years later to investigate. Yep, us humans just ain't getting any smarter in the next couple of decades. Deliver Us the Moon is less of a classical game with high scores and character progression and more of an experience interspersed with mini-games. You take on the role of Fortuna, worryingly named from an ancient Greek goddess of luck, and have to make your way from a rocket base on Earth to the moon via the space station responsible for the microwave power transfer from a helium-3 based power plant on the moon. To get there, you have to solve puzzles, find stairs, inhale oxygen and cut a lot of wires. Level 1 is set on Earth and does a good job of setting the initial mood, giving you the background story and teaching you the basics of solving challenges. It also includes the evergreen run to the elevator during countdown and then wait trope, so you know no expenses were spared in script writing. Narration is primarily by the game's other main character via comms, but you'll miss out if you don't go and explore the environs. The final stage of level 1 was set in a rocket cockpit with an in-scene computer screen that proved hard to read at times, and while the previous steps were all very smooth, this part ended on a low point. You don't actually have to manually do any of the flying to get to the moon, though as level 2 starts and you're approaching Pearson Station in orbit, at probably something like 58,000 kilometers above the moon's surface, you'll get a first challenge of docking your rocket with the space station. This part will likely seem trivial to any Kerbal Space Program players, but it's an excellent first introduction to the controls that govern the gravityless station. More of the story is told as you progress through the level, find small mementos and hear audio recordings from the previous crew. You get to navigate the different segments of the station, sort of spacewalk through an unfinished part of it, and get hints as to why it's unfinished. While the first level is clearly just an introduction, and a good one at that, Pearson Station is where the linearity of the game really shows up guarding you through the station in ways that at times seems illogical or strange, except for speeding you along to the next puzzle. It isn't really a problem, just don't think too much about why there's only two crew rooms, yet workstations for 8-10 to 10 people. Soon enough you'll get to the moon, with more room to look around and move around, though it remains pretty linear. Here the game does a good job tying in events that predates it, and adds more characters to the story even though you're still alone with just a calm voice from Earth urging you on. More is revealed about the complete absence of the moon crew and how the station crew tried to understand what was going on and storytelling continues being the central part. Uh, it's difficult at this point to really talk about what happens next without spoiling things and the game really needs to be experienced and not explained. The world around delivers the moon. The WSA, the equatorial desert and the people on the stations is fleshed out in a well told story. Of course you can miss a fair part of this if you just rush through but take your time and get into every corner and the writing rewards you. There's plenty of small gaps in the story like Helium 3 already exists in large quantities on earth even if not easily accessible while mining on a moon still requires going through absurd processes like going through 150 million tons of regolith per ton of helium-3, or lunar space elevators, or beaming power to Earth's surface, but ignore those and you get a good story in a nice setting and great visuals. Yeah, I've taken a moment of five just to look out of windows. The game is out already, but there's more on the way in the form of free DLC, and support for Nvidia's brand new DLSS has also been announced to make the game even better looking on RTX graphics cards. Mouse and keyboard controls work well enough, but movement seems to flow better with controller. Unfortunately, using controller to interact with objects was fiddly and at times outright frustrating to get to aim properly. In a couple of sequences where there's a countdown as you're trying to flip the right switches, this gets really detrimental to the overall experience. And having to still hit tap on the keyboard to access notes and locks when using a controller is also strange. This specific function doesn't seem to be mapped or at least not mapped when using a PlayStation DualShock 4, and along with only showing default button icons from Microsoft controllers makes the development seem a bit lazy. 
from my own experience, it's not an excessive amount of work to query what control is attached and use relevant mapping and icons, testing included. And if it solves the issue of having to still use a keyboard, it improves the general experience. On the design, I gave it a 9. The visuals, the mostly absent soundscape, the voice acting, the puzzles are all very well done, for the most part. There's a few cases where puzzles are too easy, things almost too linear, but that's sort of in line with what Delivers the Moon tries to be. Challenge, I gave it a 7. Puzzles and challenges range from accidentally solving without realizing there was one, too frustrating due to visual limitations or failing to recognize a box floating in space. The on-rails nature of most of the game also limits this part as there's never really more than one solution and simply trying every part until something lights up is an option in many cases. For fun I gave it an 8. Now this is an odd category for a game this sombre, definitely enjoyable with a good well told story. Controls are frustrating though. But I'm leaving the score at 8, in the hopes that Kyokin might address it in a future update. Longevity and replayability, a 6. So far I've seen no reason to replay the game, or to try and explore other parts of the base. You walk through pretty much everything due to how the game progresses, and except for the moment you stop to take in the surroundings, there's, there's a very predictable amount of time being spent. The news of a free DLC does help though, as I do want to return to the game, just need a good excuse. And on price, a 7. At 20 euros on Steam, the price is very fair for what the game is. A linear story, an experience with puzzles, and it would also be fair at 25 or even the 30 bacon tokens asked for the collector's edition, especially in light of the announced free DLC. So finally, the overall score, 7.4 out of 10, 